Are you okay, Leon? Wait. Ya es hora de asplastar. How's it going? Welcome to episode 25 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And with that said, let's get going. So we start our plucky adventure inside the car ride. And if you remember well, most of this scene takes place inside the car with close up shots of Leon and the two red shirts, which begs the question, what's outside the car? And it turns out there's actually a pretty large environment, one that you would never be able to see, but the developers actually made a long stretch of road for the car to drive down. And how about that one scene where the guy uh, relieves himself? <laughs> Is there anything there? Well, uh, thankfully no, but there's actually a lot of hand gesture animation that's out of shot. Which is pretty surprising to me. Typically if they do something like that, they want to keep it in. Now if you're a little disappointed because you wanted something a little more risque, don't worry you little pervert, I got you covered. So first off, how amazing is it that there's two live models behind just a simple radio texture? Now watch as that revelation is immediately overshadowed by what I'm about to show you. So we got Hunnigan here and if you zoom in on Hunnigan's blazer, you find out that actually her clothing apparel and her skin all have their own separate layers, which is not something you typically see in any video game, let alone a GameCube game. Uh, but oddly enough, the game designers at one point intended for Hunnigan to at least take off her blazer. Now beyond that, I don't know, I, I can't imagine they want her to take off her blouse, but she actually has skin from her shoulder down to her breast length minus the nipple area. I feel super uncomfortable telling you guys this, but I must go on. So when I was going through the game's texture files, I also found out that Hunnigan's blouse it's supposed to be see-through. If you look at the texture for Hunnigan's blouse, you can see that there's actually a black bra that bleeds through the blouse, and then every other part of her body is skin tone. We're never gonna know exactly what the developers intended, but it's very clear at this point that they wanted to show a little bit more to Hunnigan than we ever got a chance to see. Not that way, cowboy. Well, to that I say, pioneers blaze trails and yee-haw, you jerk. So anyways, what is beyond the bridge? Well, there's not much more to it. The, the reason why they have a tree texture right at the start of the bridge is because, well, once you get past the tree line, you find out that there's actually not much more to the map. They actually did hide a trail fence back here, but beyond that, there's really not much else. It's just interesting that despite the fact that they could have maybe copy and pasted some of the map that they used for the cinematic in which the car drove, they instead decided to just cover it up with some trees. And I can only imagine that they went with this route to improve performance. And now we get to see the Ganados in their natural habitat. Yeah, I'm seriously doing this. So in this scene, you're allowed to view the Ganados with your binoculars and kind of get an idea of how they would act or behave if they weren't trying to rip you to shreds. But since we can take the camera anywhere we want, we can actually get a much better look at what these people are actually doing. And despite carrying a horrendous parasite within all their bodies, they are hardworking folks, just like you and me. <laughs> Here's the very first appearance of El Gigante, and one thing that you learn very quickly with the behind the scenes of Resident Evil 4 is that when anything's off camera, it's very likely that the developers actually don't have a model there. We've covered a lot of games on Boundary Break, and it's not unusual that when a character model is in a scene, or is uh, likely going to come up in a scene, they preload it into the game. But for Resident Evil 4, these models appear out of nowhere, and they will just disappear in and out of scenes. It's kind of unusual. They have a cave troll. So as some of you die-hard Resident Evil fans may know, when you encounter El Gigante for the second time, you actually do have a chance of escaping him and getting through the door in that narrow pathway. And what many of you may not know is that he actually breaks the boundaries and destroys any house that you go into. Now the game did intend for you to see this if you thought you were being smart, but I thought it'd be really cool to get an eagle's eye view of when he actually breaks down these objects. 
So next up is the briefcase, and the briefcase actually gave me a lot of surprises. For one thing, I actually had no idea that all these objects were actually 3D models. I always just assumed that they were 2D. And also just as neat is that the briefcase is also fully rendered. Now you might have been able to make that guess because when you open up the menu, even though it opens up into the item inventory, you do get to see the briefcase briefly open. Oh god, I said brief with briefcase. So one tip that I got from my Twitter pen pal Swankybox is that in almost every single room, if not every room, there's a dump of ammo and healing items in every area. Now it's not hard at all to explain why this is the case. It's very obvious is that the developers put these in place so that they could debug the game easily and test things like picking up ammo or just having the ammo for the scenario. No. Leon. So in this incredibly brief flashback where Ashley remembers getting injected with the Las Plagas, you actually find out that this room is in the same area as the cathedral. If you were to enter the cathedral and start moving the camera all the way to your left, way off in the distance, you'll find the room where Ashley has her flashback. Now there's not much going on inside the room aside from the fact that it's small and square. It's really just designed for this one quick scene. And what's really interesting is that once this cutscene is done, much like many other things in Resident Evil 4, it disappears forever. Oh, I love these. We got ourselves another low poly peach moment. So in this case, the game wanted to have a mob of villagers. Now the problem is, is that the horsepower for the Nintendo GameCube is not so great. I mean, it was really impressive for its time, but if you want a mob, good luck. So what the developers of Resident Evil 4 did to make this work was to obviously take advantage of the GameCube's low resolution, stick a lot of people in the back, and the ones that are in the back are the ones that have pretty much Nintendo 64 graphics for bodies and faces. Now again, this is one of those scenes where it cuts around really quickly, so I had to put it in slow motion just so we can have a little bit of breathing room and actually admire or laugh at these characters. Okay, so now we're going to look at the castle, and to no one's surprise, there's really not much to the castle. It does a really great job of making you think there's a giant castle there, but as soon as you move the camera outside of the player's view, you can already start to see that there's missing walls, and even the back end of the castle isn't modeled, it's just a flat texture to represent a castle. In fact, the closest you ever get to the castle, which is right now, is even less assembled than the version of the castle that's from the first time you see it, which is far away. You know, at least with this version, there's a lot more geometry to it. So needless to say, a green herb's not going to save Louise now, and who caused the damage? It was Lord Sadler. And throughout most of this scene, you don't actually get to see Lord Sadler use his scorpion tail. So what does it look like on the other end? Well, you can at least see when the tail ends, but of course it's not connected to Sadler whatsoever. If it were, he'd be going through the floor. It's incredibly interesting to see where it does end up, especially because the position is different every time the camera angle changes. Now this was incredibly odd. I took the camera out and around the corner because I expected there to be pretty much nothing there, but I found something so much better than just nothing. I actually found out that there really is a track that the cart goes and follows along to meet to the other side where your destination is. Now the funniest thing about this by far is that the game does a quick fade in and fade out scene to just basically warp you to where you need to go. So there was absolutely no need to connect these two areas. They could have loaded this area in, but instead they have a track here. A track that they didn't end up using, but Nevertheless. I was going to leave these two scenes out because there's actually just a lot to show, but I was just too amused by this. So this narrow cave that has some dropping weights is pretty intimidating. And it's actually really, really interesting looking when you take the camera outside of that hallway and you look at it from the side. It's amazing how intricate and how much is going on all at once. And what's that dome off in the distance? Well, I'm very glad that I asked that question, because what it turned out to be was a simulated sky. So when you get to that area of the game, you look up and you see the sky moving around, which indicates that you're going to be taking an elevator back to the surface. But from the outside, it's a dome. And just in general, it's amazing to me how much is going on in Resident Evil 4, even when you're standing in a room so insignificant. Because even then, you might find out that there's actually a lot going on in the background. So in this scene, just before you fight Salazar, you would think that taking the camera through all that gobbledygook in the background would be the most interesting thing. But I'll tell you right now, that actually turned out to be not the case. 
but just below this boss room is the stage that is set up to play out that small cutscene when you see Ashley being whisked away to the island. It took me a while to figure out what was going on down here, but what you're looking at is the island that's supposed to have all the buildings that you're going to see in a minute, and then everything around it is the ocean water in which Krauser is piloting his boat, which segues really well into the next scene. So, so, now something I never paid attention to is that apparently it's Krauser that's the one riding the boat. And how do I know that? Well, he basically has all the same gear as Krauser, minus the face for some reason. <laughs> And this right here is definitely one of my favorite things about the show. When you're too focused on being the boss, you oftentimes don't really get a good chance to just kind of soak in what that boss really looked like. And so I feel like there's a lot of value in just taking the camera around and getting a better look at the boss from various angles and really understand what a boss like Salazar looked like from a different perspective. about time. Sorry, bad traffic. I'll cover you. Mike is totally the man. But there's something a little odd about Mike. Now, Mike doesn't actually show up in the cockpit in very many scenes. In fact, I only counted two total. But when he was in that scene, I found something very strange. If you zoom the camera up to Mike's face, you can see that Mike actually has yellow eyes. Now, there's only one other character that I can think of that has yellow eyes. And if you're at the very least a casual Resident Evil fan, you'd know that the most famous character with yellow eyes is Wesker. Why, <laughs> I just don't get why they gave him yellow eyes. That's so strange. And I thought I'd end this episode out with a zoom out and sweeping shot of the area where you fight Krauser. It's incredible how much they put into this game. And if I were to include as many landscapes as beautiful as this one, this episode would have gone on for at least 40 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Hey guys, sorry Pat's out this week so you won't be seeing me in front of a camera, unfortunately. But, thank you so much for watching. I think this turned out to be one of my favorite episodes. So the two contestants for the poll this week is going to be Wii Sports, once again, versus Sonic Adventure 2. I definitely wanted to do both of those games, so I can't wait to see who ends up on top. And if you're new to my channel, check out my playlist. I actually have a lot of games that I covered, so maybe you'll find another one that you grew up enjoying. Anyway guys, have a happy Halloween, stay safe, and have some fun. I'll catch you later.